All right, I have started the recording. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Game Development Club session. Uh, you guys know me, I'm Josh. Um, today we are having Professor James Coltrane give a talk about, is it one or both of the games? Uh, I think technically both. Okay, technically both of the games. Um, for those who don't know Professor Coltrane, he was previously a professor of history. Is that right? Yep. Uh, and now he is a professor uh, in the digital media and design department for game art. And uh, he's going to be talking about making games uh, and how to incorporate history into making those games and what inspired him in doing that and the process. And he's going to be giving us the the insider, the insider scoop um, on all of these super fun and cool things. I'm also going to turn on... Oh my goodness. Sorry, I have to... Act- Okay, sorry about that. Um, Yeah, so uh, why don't you take it away? Um, The time is yours, and I'm going to go ahead and mute my mic. All right, awesome. Uh, So I'm going to tell all of you about the the couple of projects that I've been working on and sort of where they came from, um, and then uh, uh, we can chat a little bit. If if any of you have questions, then we can talk a little bit about um, uh, the process of, like, making a historical game and how you might work if you wanted to do something in period. Uh, and please, um, <clears throat> I'm not sure like what the etiquette here is, but like if any of you um, uh, have questions or want to comment as we're going, please feel free to butt in. Uh, this can be as conversational as any of you are interested. Is there, I'm, I'm not like a big Discord person. Is there like a raise hand equivalent um, or anything like that? Or like, is there an accompanying chat for this or... Uh, typically what we do is, uh, if anybody has any, like, questions, we just have the general chat, and people just pop their, uh, stuff in there. Um, uh, usually what we do is we keep our mics muted for the presentation, and then when it's time for questions, but if you would like to just have, like, a more open floor, I feel like that's super fun. Um. Yeah, I I just, anybody has permission to yell at any time, as far as I can. Uh, Yeah. Just, uh, as the spirit moves you, as they say. Um... (laughs) All right, so my main project, which I've been working on for many years, started up in Nebraska when I was a historian, is Cassius. And so let me tell you a little bit about what that's about and where that came from. Um, this came out of some time that I spent uh, on a fellowship at Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, I, in my former role as a historian, uh, the, you know, the reason I got into the game dev was I did a lot of stuff with uh, 3D visualization. So I was doing some like precise architectural reconstructions for them, and uh, these are all pretty bad, but, uh, you know, uh, I was having a good time there and kind of starting to think more about games. And, and one of the things that stuck out to me being in Williamsburg, uh, which is a really uh, lovely place at a fantastic living history museum, is uh, that, you know, I was a, it was a little unnerving, um, even despite recent efforts, like how little slavery makes a, a presence there. Um, and this is the same at many historic sites that are um, uh, dating back to the 18th century. Um, obviously this is something that's present at Monticello where maybe they make like a little bit of an effort to show something like one of these reconstructed slave cabins. Uh, but they don't really get the, the sense of the scale, you know, uh, like for instance, Williamsburg in the 18th century, the population was 50% enslaved people. Uh, you know, a place like Monticello, the Thomas Jefferson owned something like, uh, three or 400 people, depending on what period we're talking about. Um, and you know, this is kind of reflects a larger, um, kind of culture of ignorance around, um, you know, the, the presence of slavery in colonial America, all the way down to, you know, many of these places being used as popular wedding sites, including this is Westover Plantation, one of the ones that um, I've actually been to um, in Virginia. And, uh, you know, we see this same kind of ignorance about uh, colonial slavery reflected in the, the questions that uh, museum guides get. So this is a Twitter account called African American History Fail where a former uh, historic site uh, tour guide uh, uh, talks about all of the ridiculously ignorant questions that she got. Um, And, you know, one of the uh, premier ones here is, uh, I was talking about abuses by slaveholders, tourists smugly, now surely not all masters were like that. eh? Um, So, you know, this is something that we see uh, in public spaces. And, you know, this is also, you know, I was grappling with like, uh, you know, misconceptions about slavery. Uh, that I saw in my own, uh, you know, lectures as a historian and just that, you know, things that people would bring 
uh, to class, uh, most of which tended to, you know, some of which were just based on pure ignorance, but some of which tended to, to align with like not having an ability to like empathize with enslaved people as, as real people, as like peers in the human race. And at the same time, uh, I was playing a, a bunch of narrative indie games that kind of came out of like the, the first wave of like thoughtful uh, story driven games in you know, uh, 2012, uh, 13, 14 era. And uh, one of these has gone home, which kind of kicked off the uh, genre of the walking simulator. And uh, I imagine most of you are familiar with this. Um, and uh, this format of kind of like snooping as a game, especially in a space where the people are no longer there, but the, the traces of them are there as a narrative device, uh, really just um, seemed like a great format for historians. I mean, some people have compared gone home to a museum, you know, that you're going around and looking at the artifacts of the family, so to speak. Um, and another game that was influential is a mobile game called The Room, which I liked, which is kind of a puzzle game. It's had many sequels. Um, but I like the kind of tactile uh, gadget gadgetry that was involved with that. Um, so I started to kind of think about, um, you know, how I might narrativize a story that attempted to kind of put slavery um, at the center of like the the lit memory landscape of the founding fathers. And, um, you know, I had a couple of interventions that I wanted to make as part of the story. Um, the the first is that, you know, like slavery is absolutely central to the lives of some of the most important founders of, of the United States, uh, especially uh, you know, uh, Washington, Jefferson and Madison pictured here. We're all top tier founding fathers, all creatures of the Enlightenment, uh, but also, you know, large slave owners who were implicated in, uh, you know, broad scale commercialized slavery. Um, and so I wanted to get the sense that, you um, <clears throat> you know, that was sort of an inescapable part of their enlightenment existence. And uh, also the scale, you know, um, uh, on some of these plantations in Virginia, this is a Carter's Grove, uh, people can own up to 1500 other people outright, which is a, a really a, a just amazingly intense thing to think about. And, and the scale is so big is that some of these individual farms functioned almost like counties. They were so big, uh, you know, that they had all the things you would have in a town and, and, and for the time, the same population of the number of people that would be in a town, but it's all in this, in this little uh, uh, kingdom where people are being held hostage. So, so those, are, those are two points. Uh, another thing that I wanted to emphasize, and this is something that comes up a lot at the museums and also in my classroom, um, is uh, to, to make the point that the evil of slavery was not limited to your material condition. Uh, and what I mean by that is like, it's, it's really easy for everybody to think like, um, yeah, you know, like slavery is terrible. Like I wouldn't want to work all day for free. I wouldn't want to live in a crummy slave cabin. Uh, but when we see things like this, this is a reconstructed coachman's apartment from um, uh, Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, and so this is the, the guy who would drive the fancy, the fancy coach around uh, who was enslaved. And uh, sometimes guests see something like this and they say, well, that's a pretty nice bed and they would see the outfit and they would say oh that's a pretty that's a pretty nice outfit that he wore and think like you know he actually probably would have been better off than uh some white some white people at the same time or living in in crummy cabins on the frontier or something like that and of course you know that that mistakes all of the other uh extreme uh dangers and abuses that are associated with it just outside of like your your day-to-day -day, um you know material condition you know uh enslaved people uh, are always uh, subject to uh, uh, um, outsized punishment. They're subject to threats to their spouses. Uh, they literally don't have control over their children to be taken away from their children at any point. They don't have control over their bodies. They don't have any kind of sexual autonomy. Uh, and they're denied even the recognition of their humanity, both socially and, and legally. And uh, these things don't change uh, even if you're in a position where, you know, maybe your dinner is not actually that bad or your shirt is not actually that bad. And so I wanted to, to get at some of those uh, underemphasized aspects of, of slavery. And then I also wanted to, uh, you know, kind of present um, the way that enslaved people are, are resisting and carving out their own, their own culture. Um, so we have examples of uh, surviving artifacts, and unfortunately, we have so few of these. Both of these are kind of celebrity artifacts because they uh, they're so rare. Uh, but we have a, a drum uh, from uh, Virginia and a, uh, a banjo from uh, I believe from South Carolina, both of which have been preserved. And so I wanted to show 
um, some of that as well. Um, <clears throat> so I uh, uh, started thinking about the sort of the outline of the story. And, and uh, early on, this was really, really small. It was like a, I had an idea for like a 10 minute thing uh, where um, uh, uh, you're being, it's first person, you're being chased through the woods uh, and then you find your way into a small cabin uh, and then you explore the cabin and everything is kind of in this weird writing that you don't quite understand. And then when you get to the end of it, uh, you realize that you in fact are an escaped slave and the kind of symbols represent um, your uh, illiteracy or partial literacy. Um, but as I just started on that little, little kind of demo type story, it started getting bigger and bigger in my mind. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be cool if it was in uh, a huge plantation house and we got to just sort of see the, every aspect of the system. And so then I started thinking about how to get the house empty. And I thought, well, it could possibly have been evacuated during um, the American Revolution, which is something that was common. Uh, people would have to leave when they thought that they might be raided by the British. And so then finally, I get this kind of outline of a story okay, where the main Cassius character, Cassius, will be on the run. Uh, he is carrying a, a forged slave pass. Um, enslaved people at this time, when they traveled, if they traveled on business for their master, uh, would have to have a, a written permit. And so he has one of these that's been forged. Excuse me. And um, uh, the idea is that um, there's somebody who's been paid off to pick him up on a river barge and take him uh, out of the county. <clears throat> and this is sort of his cover to escape. And the idea is that he was working with uh, other enslaved people and kind of a network to, to get people out. Um, and then the, uh, uh, so he has this, and then the mechanic of this is that even though it was written for him by somebody who's, who's fully literate, he's only partially literate. And so uh, the things that he can read are in English and the things that he can't are kind of in this uh, uh, glyph type font. And so, when he gets into the house, the basic mechanic of the game is that he finds a map and notices that the locations on the map are places that are on his past. So the route that he's supposed to take after he's been separated from the other people that were uh, uh, planning this escape with him. And so uh, then you go around the house and using context clues, unscramble the gifts and uh, or the uh, glyphs into the appropriate words and slowly un unlock uh, your route um, to your escape and then uh, make your way. And so that's, this, that's the kind of main story of mechanic. And then the secondary aspect of this is as a teaching tool that as you go along, you first learn about the kind of Jeffersonian central family um, and uh, all the cool stuff that they're doing and maybe are a little bit tempted to um, uh, be impressed by their like enlightenment lifestyle and their big fancy house. Um, you learn about the uh, friendship that their youngest daughter has with um, uh, an enslaved girl who is the daughter of uh, one of the domestic servants in the house. Um, and then as you go, uh, you learn kind of about both the uh, this white family and this enslaved family and uh, uncover a series of increasingly distressing realizations uh, that not only show the way that, you know, hundreds of people at large are being mistreated on this plantation, but in particular, how the link between these two girls uh, leads to a series of events that uh, basically ends up destroying uh, the enslaved girl, whose name is Lucy, uh, destroying destroying her family. And the narrative also kind of as you go, um, picks off uh, each member of the white family one by one and shows ways in which they have been complicit um, or, you know, contributed, uh, even uh, if, you know, you might have been inclined to kind of uh, admire them early in the game. So there's kind of a, a bait and switch there. And that, you know, involves uh, exploring uh, the abandoned uh, slave cabins and fields and then other kind of like proto-industrial area, areas like uh, Smithy and a mill and stuff like that. Here's the interior of one of the slave cabins. Um, and uh, 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 more outside. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk any more about the story later if anybody wants to jump in with questions. But I'll talk just a little bit about some of the resources that I used in while I was working on Cassius. Um, obviously, like I had the opportunity to be in Williamsburg, which was a big deal. So I did a lot of reading in their archives. Uh, I looked at um, historic surveys of surviving um, uh, Virginia uh, houses. Um, I consulted with uh, scholars, both in Virginia, and then these are some of my colleagues at Nebraska who uh, have written variously on, on slavery, and then uh, some of them are uh, um, 
uh, film directors and, and novelists. Um, and, uh, you know, something we'll, you know, talk about this in the second half of the presentation today too, but uh, there's this real balancing act where like, for instance, just in the design of the house, you know, I was incorporating a composite of different things that were all uh, historically accurate, but trying to scoot them around a little bit in a way that would serve both the, the structure that I needed for this as a game level, but also, um, you know, the order that I sort of wanted the story to go in. Um, and, uh, you know, the research even went down to like some of the actual photographic uh, uh, photographs that I took on site ended up being textures in the game. Um, here's kind of the wireframe of the uh, layout of the house. And then, uh, you know, we get the finished interiors, uh, the things like this is uh, one of the ballrooms. Um, uh, uh, there's also, you know, um, you know, the, the, the point of the puzzles in this game was not only to let you play with a lot of different 18th century stuff, but also to, you know, structure how the player is moving around. Because, you know, there's a part of me that would like to do a game like this just as a pure walking simulator without any puzzles. Because um, I think you get that sense of like mystery more. Uh, but the reason that I didn't feel comfortable doing with that is because it would be possible for people to kind of skip over all of the story beats that uh, I wanted them to get. I just didn't want people to like walk in this house and just be like, man, you know, like Thomas Jefferson is awesome and, and, and skip over all of the interventions that I was making. So the puzzles give me kind of a structure uh, where I can attach important story beats to um, and not have people uh, miss anything. Um, and so here's just a few more examples. It's just, you know, all, all the kind of gadgets that, you know, uh, you can play with. And, and another thing that I uh, realized while I was working on this is just how many sort of like tropey things in puzzle games actually are kind of tied to like enlightenment, uh, or maybe a little bit later, like a Victorian inquiry. So it's really easy to put, you know, um, uh, microscopes and chess sets and all these different sorts of things, uh, uh, in the game. Uh, um, so, so, um, uh, there are also some technical problems to solve. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I had a quick question too, just about, um, so I, I know you were talking, cause I know you want us to just jump in, but, um, yeah, yeah, go for it. yeah so like when you were initially making the game, um, I know you kind of talked about making it more linear so that players can't really miss these story beats that you specifically want them to like read about and want to hear about so that they don't just kind of have this sort of, um, this this implicit like oh these people are great goodbye you know like they actually you want them to explore the mansion you want them to learn um were you initially trying to make the game as sort of a non-linear experience where the player like moved around the house more naturally and found different pieces before they you know left i, I suppose um or were you always thinking of like they'll do this room first then this activity and then they'll learn about this and kind of go from that yeah, I mean, I think I wanted it to be structured a little bit early on, but I was thinking of it as a lot more freeform and a lot less directed, uh, kind of kind of like Gone Home or some of these other things where there's just like, there's no, there's not much scaffolding. Um, and then, like I said, because of kind of the instructional nature of this, I switched to more linear, but within that, like the... Uh, the amount of space that you can move in kind of gets bigger as you go along in the game, zone to zone. Um, and there are, you know, in the early stages of the game, there's like one puzzle you can do in a room and then it goes to two and then you're in like an open space with multiple buildings and it's like three or four puzzles. And so uh, kind of as uh, it um, can trust you, you know, the world gets bigger uh the other thing in terms of like puzzle design that was like a little tricky well there, there are a couple things uh one was like unlike portal or something like that um uh puzzle design on this was tricky is because they're all of the puzzles are tied to like the the context of the environment right so like the chess set has to be somewhere a chess set would be and if it turns out that like the chess set puzzle is easier or harder than I want it to. I can't like move the chess set into a barn. Uh, like you could shuffle around like puzzles that are have more similar structural elements in other games. So like the the like learning curve of it is kind of an issue. And then the other thing, you know, just thinking a lot about audience, um, you know, I figured that this is a game that I want, you know, I want people who like story games, especially people who like walking simulators to play this game, people who like puzzle games to play this game. 
Uh, but I figured that there would be people interested in this game who are not gamers. And so that also led to like some of the decisions I made about structure. Like early on, you know, there was a lot of like picking up and holding objects and taking them across the room. And then at a certain point, uh, that was cut out because I was just thinking like, there's going to be a lot of people playing this game who could like drop, uh, you know, the little key or something that they have and then be totally lost. Uh, and kind of as a corollary to that, the, another thing that um, uh, I had to keep track of, which also uh, vibes with, uh, you know, the slide that's on here now that I'm going to talk about in a second is, uh, is light. Um, Cause I wanted this to be candlelit and very moody. Uh, but that also, that was another reason that I decided to take out people being able to hold stuff because I didn't want them to drop it in like a dark corner and then, then be really, really lost. Um, so yeah. Um, so let's talk just a little bit about some technical uh, things that I did. Like candles was something that I spent a lot of time on uh, because they were so important to the mood. Um, and uh, you know, when I was looking at the way that people had done candles, uh, I didn't really like any of them. So this involved using like a film sprite uh, for the actual one uh, for the for the flame and then using a, an emissive texture on the candles that's animated uh, so that, that as the candle lights, the um, the flame spray uh, just grows as a transform on scale and gets bigger. Uh, the, the lights uh, fade in, but then also that emissive texture fades in. Um, so we get kind of this nice effect. Um, and also this is using like real time shadows. So it's, the candles are very expensive. But because uh, this occurs in the enclosed environments in the game, I can kind of get away uh, with that. Um, and this is also just showing like then I um, uh, did uh, custom animations for the candle position and brightness that match the rhythm of the sprite. Um, and then like wrote some scripts so that um, I could change the relative intensity uh, of the candles um, based on how, how big the room was. Um, so that it would be the exact amount of illumination that I wanted. And there's, there's other little like things that happen with these, like, uh, uh another one is that the uh, reflection maps, uh, update every time you light a candle, uh, they couldn't be live because that was too intensive, but they, they come in every time you light a candle so that the, all of the, um, uh, specular things, uh, have the appropriate reflections for the amount of light in the room. So on the left is reflection probe with no candles lit and on the on the right is with all candles lit um and you can see like the the difference in the two lighting schemes like dark to light um <clears throat> and let's see here i'm talking about some other games um so uh that's still in uh, in progress and um uh will will come out someday uh but uh last fall as i was uh, as i was getting closer um to uh, thinking about uh, getting close to the end of Cassius. Um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, this was made in uh, the old standard uh, render pipeline. So I'm still working like uh, a ways back. And um, <clears throat> I, would, uh, I would love to uh, <clears throat> use some of the like fancy stuff of the newer versions of Unity, but um, <clears throat> my greatest uni Unity frustration is that uh, um, that like there are so many things that you need third-party plugins to do well in Unity? Like just in my game, like sky, terrain shader, vegetation distribution, um, uh, uh, some lighting things. All of those are like third-party plugins, and that creates so many potentials for bugs, both with your own code and then with them, you know, relating to one another. Uh, input is another one. Uh, that um, I'm just always really, really scared of, of Unity versions. So I go like as slowly as possible. Um, so anyway, so I was thinking about Cassius and, uh, you know, a couple things occurred to me. This is my first game. Uh, I really wanted to make a big splash. And uh, I didn't like the idea of having all the pressure on the release. And also just like, I was thinking about, I really want to build a community before like I drop my big my big first project. And you know, that's just a tough thing to do, especially at the time living in Nebraska. And so I was thinking, well, like, how what can I do to like um, you know, build a community in advance of the, the bigger game? And I was thinking, well, maybe I can release a very, very short uh kind of free experience um 
and uh, you know, use that to generate some interest. And then that kind of can be my like base online community that I can can grow from uh, leading up to Cassius. And uh, um, <clears throat> so I started thinking about uh, in the trailer, which some of you may have seen, which I could show um, uh, uh, later. Uh, there's this concept that like the trailer for Cassius is you're in a museum in the modern day at the site of the fictional plantation in the game. And then slowly things kind of like de-age and then you, you kind of like are whisked back to scenes from Cassius. And so I had that device and I was thinking like, oh, well maybe as like a free experience, you could just like walk around the gallery from the trailer and I would put that up. And so I thought that would be cool. Uh, and then, you know, slowly that idea also got bigger in my head. And at some point I thought like, um, well, it would be cool, you know, once again, thinking about like guiding the interpretation if you played as a as a person. Um, and I had the idea, like, what if there was a young uh, black uh, summer intern in this museum who thinks things are a little sketchy? Uh, and then as she's kind of exploring the museum, maybe she finds uh, some kind of like cover up or hidden information or something like that. Um, and so I started working on that, playing with that idea. And then that just got totally out of control uh, and basically became uh, its own its own game. And uh, now that is a, is a complete story. And that game is called Black Haven. And that's what uh, an early version of this is available for some of you to play today. And um, <clears throat> um, so so that's what the uh, the next few shots are from. And so this is at the Black Haven Historical Society, which is like the museum built at the, the site of the house from the game. Um, and uh, you are a summer intern who is doing a lot of kind of uh, everyday tasks that also like take you around and show you like how the museum is presenting uh, the uh, the memory of the uh, Harwood family or the, the slaveholding family of Blackhaven Hall. Blackhaven is the name of the uh, mansion from Cassius. Um, and uh, uh, to kind of spice this up, I had the idea that. Um, you know, uh, the ruins of Black Haven have, have had this uh, like modern glass superstructure built on top of them. It's like a preservation thing. And I was actually inspired by, if, if any of you want to Google, there's a, a plantation site called Minokin, M-E-N-O-K-I-N, that's doing this exact thing. Uh, and uh, so uh, you also go on like an audio tour of the, of the house um, and then you're in the museum and, and the house. Uh, the story in the game is that the uh, uh, house was burned down by a raid during the American Revolution, and uh, uh, all of the um, uh, presentation of the museum is kind of presenting the story. And then in the later half of the game, you go into the archives uh, and start, uh, you're supposed to scan documents for their website as an intern. And as you go through, you start discovering uh, this story uh, that spans over the 19th and 20th centuries. It not only shows like a lot of the things that the museum is covering up, uh, but in particular, um, uh, another member of the black community in the 60s who's pictured here, um, who was kind of conducting her own investigation. And then you end up in kind of this story where there's an intergenerational um, connection between uh, uh, you, the player, uh, and this woman, Dorothy, uh, from mid-century. And so uh, uh, that, uh, you know, resolves itself in kind of surprising ways. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, oh yeah, yeah, this is actually anticipating my uh, what I was going to say next. Um, so um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, the way that these two work together is like, um, I, you know, Black Haven comes out first and that's to generate um, uh, in, uh, uh, interest in Cassius, it is a standalone thing. I think it is totally enjoyable as a, as a story. The story comes to a resolution. It's not just a demo or a prologue or something like that. Um, but uh, I think there's a lot of side little questions and curious things that you come across in Black Haven that you'll be like, huh, like, I wonder, I wonder what that's about, or that's weird, or why did they spend time on that? And every single one of those things will be um, answered in Cassius. And then I hope, I mean, I don't know if there'll be this level of super fans or whatever, but I hope that um, after people play Cassius, they'll want to go back and play 
uh, Blackhaven again because there will be a, there's a ton of Easter eggs and little ironies and references and stuff like that uh, that I think make both more emotionally effective when you know um, the the sort of entire story of uh, of where things are going and here's uh, some of the just the interior of the house uh, at night. Um, so just really quickly a little bit about um, like where I'm at, especially with Blackhaven. Um, uh, I have, um, the game is in a mostly stable uh, beta build, although I keep creating new bugs as I add new things and then squashing them. All of you know who th know how that's like if you've worked on your own uh, full projects. Uh, I just recorded the voice for the main character. Uh, uh, the character's name is Kendra and the uh, actress's name is Darby Farr uh, last week, uh, actually a week ago today. And I'm almost done integrating that. I have a couple of other minor bit parts that I also need to record. Uh, but this uh, sucker is gonna be completely done at the end of the month uh, or so. And then I'm just gonna be looking at, uh, um, after doing a bunch of testing uh, windows for um, you know when, when it should actually drop on Steam, but it'll just go on Steam, it'll be completely free. And uh, I hope it gets a shitload of downloads. Um, my uh, history and games class is gonna play it. And uh, uh, any of you uh, are welcome to play the, the version that was posted today, or if you want to wait uh, a little bit and play the one uh, with the voice, uh, uh, you know, I'll just uh, welcome any kind of uh, uh, anybody who wants to play or, or uh, give feedback or anything like that. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, we'll <laughs> I'll probably see how that goes and how the reception to that works. Um, and then, uh, you know, Cassius will come out. Uh, maybe 2022, I'm thinking I, I might want to do as like a palate cleanser, like a little um, uh, Paul Revere, like endless runner on mobile uh, over the summer. Um, but uh, so I might do that and then do, do Cassius. Um, the one other thing in terms of strategy about like why Blackhaven exists, which I also think is useful, is that, um, you know, Cassius is dealing with uh, sensitive topics in a very emotionally charged period in our, our history. And uh, Cassius goes all in on being gamey, right? Like it has spooky art, it's a gothic story, it has puzzles. Um, and I think that people, you know, I think people who play games, nothing in it is particularly controversial, but people who don't understand what games can be used for might find it uh, a little bit much or be a little skeptical of it. And so I think that's another thing that Black Haven does is that um, it's a much calmer, um, less intense, less immediate effect. There's some fucked up stuff that happens in Black Haven, but it is all in the past and it's being uh, dealt with at a distance. And so um, I just think that like this uh, could arguably have been a better like first project to release because it's just a little bit more chill. Um, and the other thing is, is that, you know, like uh, I'm an old white guy and I'm, uh, you know, writing a, a main character who's a 19 year old black girl. And so uh, I worked with um, some people that I have previous connection with at uh, Xavier University of New Orleans, including a communications professor there named Sharon Roberts and also a, um, a group of students who uh, worked with me on the script and we did a table read. And, uh, you know, worked on the dialogue both to make sure that it doesn't sound like an old white guy from Kansas and also to make sure that um, it, it seemed like it was respectful and representative of their experience as uh, young black women at a HBCU. And so, um, you know, I think that contribution or that uh, collaboration was important. Um, and, uh, you know, that was another thing that you know, obviously I consulted with a lot of historians on Cassius, but then, you know, I, I, I couldn't get that kind of input and collaboration for a period piece the way I could for something that was in the present day. And um, so that's another, uh, you know, just reason why I, I think I'm glad that this is coming out first. And um, Darby, the uh, uh, actress uh, also uh, was at um, Xavier and she now is uh, at uh, SCAD in Georgia uh, pursuing uh, her acting career, which I hope this will be a little boost uh, for that. So um, if we want, we can uh, do a little bit of Q&A on any of that. And uh, um, then after chatting for a little bit, um, I can talk to you about like steps you might take with, if you ever want to do a period piece.
Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, when you told other historians um, that you were making this 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 digital game about these very, like, strong events, these very emotional events, I feel like the, the general perception of video games in modern day press, and especially, like, you know, in, like, the, the, the 90s and, like, late 80s, is that video games are violent and kind of rot your brain, right? And I feel like that rhetoric has, has sort of floated around, um, in for for as long as for as long as anybody can really remember um so did you face a lot of backlash when you kind of went to other historians and said hey i want to make this digital game i want to put all this stuff in it that's very serious did they did you kind of see find that people were against that did you find that people you know supported that what did you how did you feel about that or how did they feel about that rather yeah yeah well yeah there's a there's a lot to this so first of all in general it was all over the place and it seemed mostly to track like generationally and also like with people's exposure to video games. So like anybody, people who tended to be younger and, you know, for prof professors, younger is like 35 or whatever. And uh, uh, who um, or who had just played video games before, they tended to be more receptive. Um, but, uh, you know, I had a couple of people, including like probably my closest colleague at Nebraska, um, who is relatively young, but is not into video games. And I kind of told her the pitch. And, you know, she trusted me as a thoughtful scholar, but I just remember she was just like, oh, James, man, this is going to get you in trouble. Like you people, are, people are not going to like this. And, you know, that that made me really, really think. And, um, you know, we had to talk about it. And she said, like, look, you know, like, here's some people I know. You know, she's like, they're in, more into media as black scholars. She's like, talk to them. And like, if if they think this can work, you know, then she's like, then I'm I'm on board with it. And so and so I did that, you know, and that was tense. Uh, but, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time. I kind of formed like a little like ad hoc advisory board and talked to like black filmmakers and uh, black novelists. And, um, uh, you know, like once they sort of understood like what had been done and stuff like, like Gone Home and, you know, and even in other, you know, more mainstream games that, you know, had elaborate narratives and stuff like that, then they got, actually got excited about it. And then, you know, like by the time that I had like the trailer and took that back to my colleague who was so worried at the beginning, you know, she thought it was awesome. Uh, but I think a lot of it is, it's people who don't understand the potential of video games, but also, and this is just a tricky thing for any of you that want to do a, a, a game in a sensitive subject, you know, like people can't see in your head, <laughs> you know, like you, you in your head maybe are doing something that's really art, artsy and, and uh, respectful and thoughtful, you know, but if some of these people have only seen Super Mario, then they're just imagining some kind of horrible, like Super Mario escape slavery game or something like that. Uh, and so sometimes you actually have to take the risk of, putting a little bit of time in and then showing some people in a, like a safe space, you know, this is what I'm doing. Like how, how's it turning out? And then getting, getting that response. Um, the other thing I would say is just that like, you know, <clears throat> while I think there are, there are definitely like right and wrong ways to like approach uh, a topic like slavery, you know, the, the individual way that people react to it is going to be, very contextual about their like community and also their and i don't mean their ethnic or racial community i mean like their um intellectual community so like i talked to, to both uh black game devs and uh, black historians as i was making this game and like uh they would have very different suggestions and sometimes you know things that they would want me to do are things that i know would make the other uh, camp like roll their eyes you know like I had a black historian say like you know oh maybe at the end when like Cassius is being chased by the slave catchers you know you can he can like fist fight them or something and I just thought like oh my god that that would be terrible <laughs> that would just you know break everything and make it seem like street fighter slavery edition or what you know that it's like that that you know and obviously like you know anybody in the game dev world would like laugh that off but you know, somebody who wasn't exposed to that just, you know, 
couldn't couldn't envision that. Um, so yeah, it's been a journey. Um, and you know, that like that's, this still doesn't mean that like everybody is going to be on board with this, but I feel like I've done my due diligence and I'm proud of what, uh, I've done. Um, but you know, my, my advice to, to all of you, if you're interested in this space is just like, you know, um, you need to, you need to talk to as many people as you can and really, really pay attention to what they're telling you. Uh, uh, but on the other side, like if, if you think that you, you know, you have something that they're missing, you know, well then, you know, do it and show them, uh, don't just drop that in the world. Don't, don't release it. Uh, but, but, you know, you, you know, get them closer to what's in your head and see if that changes their mind because maybe it will. Uh, but if it doesn't, then you got to take that really seriously and think about if this is something you actually want to go forward with. That was a really good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I think, I think that's very, I think that's very interesting um, that you kind of took this perspective from so many different aspects to kind of build this, this, this project that appealed not only to like, you know, people who like to play video games but also people who are very into history i think that's actually that actually makes a lot of sense um okay so i i have a i have a few other questions but i would like to make sure that uh everybody here kind of has uh devin is flickering his microphone so i think that's a sign that he <laughs> that he's ready to talk so I'll, I'll pass it over to him hi yeah uh devin here big fan i did just have oh as I tear my headset off by accident um, in excitement. Um, I guess this question sort of um, applies to both uh, Cassius and Blackhaven. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering, like, the role of the the players, the player character, like the, the character that the player is embodying. Um, did you go through, like, rounds of consideration for either game about um, what sort of person the player would be uh, embodying and like um, at any point in the process, like to what extent does the player um, embody that character? Are they like on the spectrum of them just being a vessel that you're walking around into like their characteristics in game, like affect the way that you're approaching and experiencing uh, the history? Yeah, I think that they in both games, I mean they they have different personalities. I think but I think in both games they kind of play the same role. I would say that both of them are not particularly strong characters in the sense that like I don't know that I would want to, you know, like watch either of them in a film because I don't know that they're that far developed and part of that is for them to sort of serve as like uh audience avatar. But I think what they both do, and I mean, they both have a little bit of personality, but I think I think what their their job to, is to contextualize the events for uh, the player um, in places where the environment doesn't adequately do that. So like in Cassius, uh, he's making little comments as he goes around. And like there's an interplay where sometimes, you know, um, we know what he's looking at better than he does because we are more experienced in the world of the founding fathers than than he is and so there's like a little bit of like dramatic irony that like tells us something there and then other times he's alerting the players to things that they may not know because they're not into colonial history and like explaining um and also like they're uh they're like i mean kendra especially in black caveman they're a little bit of a cheat code like if you see something that is supposed to be subtle and then um uh it ends up uh but 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 you know very very troubling or or sketchy or whatever uh and you don't and you don't necessarily connect the dots on that uh either because you 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 know weren't empathetic in that way or you didn't you know you don't have like enough kind of cultural context to get that then Kendra just kind of comes out and says like oh this is really fucked up uh blah 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 um and so uh yeah they're they're there to like provide context to shape the interpretation a little bit um, to offer a little bit of like companionship in empty places and and maybe like a little bit of humor in a couple instances. But um, yeah, like in neither case, more so in Blackhaven, but like in Cassius, you know, uh, the story 
is not really about Cassius. It's more about uh, Lucy's family. Um, it's more like Cassius is telling us a story and, and then he happens to have a framing device. Uh, in Blackhaven, Kendra, it's a little more her story, uh, but in the similar sort of way, she's sort of taking us through the history of this entire plantation and also of uh, Dorothy Mitchell, the, the civil rights activist that she encounters uh, via the archives. All right, awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Another question that I have that's just sort of um, pretty, it's pretty general, but I am quite curious. Uh, what kind of liberties did you take, um, either in like the aesthetics of the game or the environment of the game, um, just design-wise to make the project as a whole more digestible for either your average gamer or somebody who has never played a video game before? I know you talked. I know you talked a lot about sort of, you know, like people who have never played a game before, like the design choice of not giving them small things that they could lose, or you know, just you know, switching to more direct puzzles to create a more linear experience, but. I was wondering if you if you had done anything else to make it more palatable for somebody who might not be into history as much, but was interested in the game as a whole. Yeah, I've tried. Well, in terms of accuracy, I've tried not to. But of course, you know, like Josh is in my uh, historical accuracy in games and film class. And, and you know, uh, it's it's impossible to make a game be totally historically accurate. But I kind of had I mean, I had a few like ground rules. Like one was um, uh, that um, uh, I wanted to have a direct reference for every single thing that I, that there could be a reference for. So, like you know, if I if I'm making a chess set and I know that somewhere out there there's a picture of an 18th century chess set, that I, I needed to find one and have that as a direct visual reference. And there were a lot of things. Um, that I, I looked at to kind of get that um, like totality of that. And that is also, you know, this is, um, you know, if, if, uh, if I talk a little bit about making your own games later, um, you know, something that is really important to do, which I did is lean on existing bases of knowledge about everyday life when you're making a period game, you know, because like you can read a really, really great book about, uh, I don't know, like, uh, uh, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln or something like that. Uh, but that's not going to tell you like, um, you know, like how did he take a shower or whatever? Uh, and, um, there's, there's all of these like very little, uh, daily life things that you're going to need to, to form a 3d world, uh, that are hard to get at. And so it's good to go somewhere. And this is what like Colonial Williamsburg did, because that's their bread and butter is like everyday life and, and, um, furnishings and trades and stuff like that. And so I leaned on that a lot. So I wanted to have a reference for everything that I could reasonably have a reference for. And then beyond that, um, I uh, was I was not allowed to put anything in the game that I knew was like inaccurate. Yeah. And and so like if I if I knew like this, you know, thing doesn't exist at this time or like, you know, I have no record of anyone ever doing X at, at any point in any way or something. And that uh, or, you know, something that was impossible that I, I really stuck to that. So as far as I, you know, there's nothing that I knowingly put in either of these games that uh, is historically impossible. Um, but I think what I leaned on are, are things that like maybe were historically improbable, uh, but could be justified in some way or another. And so like, for instance, like the Blackhaven Mansion uh would be if it existed in real life would be the single most spectacular mansion in all of Virginia. Uh, it wouldn't be like triple the size, but it would be it's like the biggest room from ever it's like I put the biggest library with the biggest ballroom and the biggest bedroom and like just made this kind of monster house that was like the best of everything. And so like that was a cheat because I just wanted to make it as interesting as possible. Or, you know, sometimes on like things where it was like um you know, oh, you, you know, maybe you don't see uh, a lot of designs that go this particular way or like, I don't know, maybe there's a chair that is like a color that, um, you know, works with the color scheme of the room, but maybe you don't have a whole lot of examples of something like that. Well, you could explain away some things like that by saying like, 
well, if the person who ordered the chair had quirky tastes or something like that, then that could be possible. Um, and, uh, uh, so there's stuff like that in terms of just like general accessibility. And this is true for almost any period game. I think the biggest cheat is in the language. Uh, you know, I've tried to make when Cassius speaks and, you know, in the writings of the documents, I've tried to make that sound, uh, somewhat like how people would talk in the 18th century, but, um, there's definitely, there's definitely cheats there. There's also like something that's kind of unavoidable is there's so many words in English that, um, well, you know, seem relatively, uh, you know, uh, old, but actually were developed really recently that you might not know. And then those would be anachronistic. Like uh, there's words like, I'm pretty sure international was not used until like the middle of the 19th century. And that just seems like such a normal word. Uh, so sometimes I would do checks in like the OED and stuff like that to like look at word history or whatever. But um that's just, that's such a tricky thing. You would basically have to be like a professor of 18th century literature to even get close. Um, and so there's, there's cheats there. Um, and then even little things like, um, you know, these people are really rich, so they would have lots of candles, uh, but they would probably not have as many candles are, as are in, in this house because that would be really, really expensive. Um, and so, uh, you know, but again, you know, that's, that's improbable, but it's not impossible because, you know, if that's what they wanted to spend their money on, they could have done that. So I tried to, um, you know, be as strict as I could, except for, you know, if I had an edge case, then I would go for improbable. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, that makes sense. I think, I think that's a, I guess that's sort of the, the, the vibe I was getting. Like you weren't you weren't gonna make everything the most, you know, unbelievably crazy thing. Like you're not going for an Assassin's Creed style thing where it's like, oh yeah, Benjamin Franklin just makes weapons now. It's like, you know, right. I, it, yeah, no, it makes sense. Like yeah, if this thing could happen and all it takes is a little bit of sort of direct action at that point in time, then sure, yeah, I get, yeah, like that's that makes sense to I'm, me. Like, I'm not opposed to people doing really, really wacky stuff, although maybe not like in the more sensitive areas of history, but. Uh, and then the other thing that's kind of hard for me to remember, which is just in my personal biography, like I was making this when I was at Nebraska, where I'm a I'm a historian and uh, really ha am struggling to like justify this to them. And so that's where like a lot of the hardcore stuff comes in. And like now, you know, even though that's kind of my orientation, because I do have this passion for like representing history, um, like DMD doesn't care about that, you know, so. So, so it's like all of a sudden I, I have to remind myself, like, oh, I have this I have this big freedom now, this realm of possibility of things I could do. And like uh, the little like Paul Revere game that I talked about that I may do over the summer, like that will be lighter and more whimsical and more stylized. Um, uh, and, you know, that'll that'll be fun because I don't have to, you know, Cassius in a way had some things that could be considered like new historical interpretations for historians. And um, I, I don't plan on any, I don't plan on trying to clear that bar for any of the other stuff that I do. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, yeah. If there are other questions, feel free to, feel free to jump in, feel free to ask them. Um, I have a question. As a, as a colleague, I guess. Um, so Ken and I have been working on Courtroom 600 now for a few years, and one of the things that we've struggled with is where where do you draw the line on ethical or moral issues in something like this? Like, one of the biggest things we've had to contend with is how do you rip Nazi and fascist iconography out of a thing that's about fascism? Because the, the real threat is you inadvertently, through nuance, create the opportunity for an audience to interpret some of the heinous actions that took place as being normal or fine or otherwise acceptable. And so <clears throat> how did you decide which episodes, which stories, which events to incorporate? And how did you draw the line on what, what kind of was ethically or morally acceptable in your eyes versus uh, what maybe mainstream designers might do? Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot with that. I mean, one of the problems that just exists in all historical fiction is uh, you ride the line between like whitewashing something because you're not honest enough about like the content in a particular period 
And then on the other side, like potentially becoming uh, exploitative and, you know, something feeling exploitative is can can very much just be um, a, a question of individual interpretation or tone, you know, but I, I mean, like a guide that I use is like, you know, um, uh, you know, if something is upsetting, uh, it should be upsetting like an Oscar movie and not like a, uh, a splatter horror movie or something like that. So I think, so I think tone is a big part of it in terms of like specific strategies. Um, first of all, like both of these games have the advantage of like having a layer of abstraction because of time. So like, uh, the most awful things that happen in Cassius uh, have already happened and he's he's recovering uh these stories and certainly in Blackhaven uh the most um uh awful things that Kendra experiences are are just she's reading them in documents they're, they're, there's not the player is not embodying that they're not interacting with that and they're not having to see those portrayed directly dramatically like in situ or whatever and so that 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 is like one thing that kind of is a little bit freeing if i was uh, doing something where somebody was like directly embodying a traumatic experience. Like first, I don't know that I would even attempt that. But second of all, like my approach to that would be a lot more um, constrained. So I think that that helps. Uh, and there's also just ways that I'm like putting my finger on the scale. Like um, Kendra and Cassius both make comments that contextualize how they feel about things. Uh, even though uh, the music isn't in Blackhaven yet. There are small uh, little musical cues, you know, that that tell you, you know, this is supposed to be sad or this is supposed to be shocking or what have you. Um, and then there also like some of that goes into story, too. You know, like um, uh, the uh, daughters of the white family, um, you know, the youngest of whom is like six. Uh, don't have a whole lot of agency in the maintenance of slavery, obviously. And so these are, are would be characters that would be easy to um, sympathize with as like, oh, well, this isn't their, their fault. And um, just to kind of keep people from going in that direction, you know, I specifically engineered, um, you know, little things that you discover about both of those daughters that uh, are, you know, show them being involved in things that are uh, uh, racist or condescending or dismissive of the enslaved people around them. And, and that is supposed to be disappointing to the player and kind of like, again, prevent them from going down certain interpretive uh, routes. Uh, I also think like, you know, it just, it, it all, all of these things work together to create the final image. But like another thing that helps in Cassius is like when you're going in this opulent house, that's so impressive. Like it is in the dark and you are the only person there and it does have this very spooky gothic atmosphere. And so that puts a different spin on it than like if you had seen it in like a beautiful spring day with like all the flowers in bloom or something like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, it uh, um, it's tricky. Um, and I, I just think I, I really do think that like what defines whether or not you're doing a good job is very holistic uh, because it's, it's a combination of all the things down to, uh, you know, the way the dialogue is written, even like the font you choose, you know, lighting, music, uh, in addition to the actual stuff that you're portraying, the quality of the voice acting um, that is ultimately going to determine whether or not something feels like respectful or um, uh, like exploitative. Yeah, that's a really good answer. Yeah, like that's I think that uh, then that kind of the take of like constructing the elements as sort of ingredients that kind of come into play whenever when I, like in in I know that you said during the sort of the as you begin moving through the, the the mansion, you're sort of like, wow, you know, like, the, the people who live here sure were, you know, enlightened and super, super, super clever and very, very interested in all these different topics like science and literature and um, stuff like that. And then, you know, as you go on, you learn the, 
the darker, more realistic truths. Um, one question that I have actually kind of relating to that, uh, do you think that uh, projects sort of like The Expanse or District 9 um, that take these concepts, you know, hard to approach concepts like slavery and like classism and refugeeism and all of these things that, you know, are some of which are still going on today, uh, do you think it's beneficial to introduce these sort of very, it's not, not tough to approach concepts, but I suppose for people who don't typically, you know, seek out that kind of material, do you think that it's beneficial to portray them in a more fictional setting? Or do you think that we should be going for a more direct sort of, like, uh, like language in terms of how these issues are portrayed and discussed? Yeah, I mean, so like on an immediate level, like I absolutely believe in historical fiction just because it gives you more latitude. I mean, that kind of goes back to like accuracy or whatever. Like this could have been a game about Thomas Jefferson, but then not only does that constrain it to a complicated actual person, but it comes with all of the uh, you know baggage attached to that. So you have to be like twice as careful um, and uh, it also means that it limits the, the possibilities for the player. So I, I definitely believe in like a, a philosophy of even if you want to do something really accurate, that a sort of composite historical fiction where like you're taking pieces, each of which have historical justification, but you're rearranging them in a new way to tell a particular story. I think that that I think that that is much more effective. I am, even though neither of these games do this. I am totally, totally in favor of, uh, you know, um, wildly, uh, um, you know, resetting or recontextualizing or re-envisioning um, difficult things in history to, um, uh, you know, make them either like more palatable or more more provocative to like a modern audience. And like District Nine, I think is is fantastic in that regard. I mean, when I was in grad school. Uh, the the media dorm that I helped out with, uh, we did like a screening where we 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 watched Avatar and District Nine like in back to back weeks and talked about um, like portrayals of colonialism. And even though Avatar is trying much harder to be like a message movie than District Nine is, uh, we all agree that like District Nine was way more effective. Um, and so I think like you can get a lot done with with genre or with um, you know, recontextualizes, uh, recontextualizations of things. I also think that like, there are examples where people take liberties with the past to illustrate a, a present realities. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. You know I mean? Like the prime example of this is like Arthur Miller's The Crucible, which is not a, a terrible um, depiction of the way things are working in Puritan Massachusetts or uh, 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 during the uh, uh, Salem witch trials. Uh, but it is a even better representation of like what people are experiencing in the 1950s and 60s with the Red Scare. And so that, you know, um, uh, it, it all just kind of has to do with what your what your goals are as a creator. You know, like uh, that's obviously a bad history, you know, to, to be like, I'm going to tell the story of Salem with the intent of. Uh, you know, showing everybody why we shouldn't be doing the Red Scare in the mid 20th century. Uh, but as a piece of art, you know, I think that's total. I think that's totally valid and and potentially a, a great strategy. So I, I, I love the idea of doing like weirder things in the future. Um, uh, and and another thing that I'm I'm really interested at in that, that I might talk about a little bit later is just uh, getting into the mental worlds of. Uh, historical people, you know, it's very easy for us to to look at architecture and fashion and uh, industry and stuff like that. Um, but I like the idea of like doing kind of like uh, uh, visual representations of just like how people see the world differently. You know, like in a in a in a in a civilization where everyone believes in magic, you know, you could depict magic uh, as as being kind of real. Uh, even though what you were doing was just representing like people's beliefs about how the world worked. Uh, and that could still be pretty historic. Yeah, no, that's a, I think, I think I get your point about the dependency of like what the creator is going for. I guess that makes a lot of sense. Like if you, if you genuinely are trying to introduce 
I, I think you're I think you're right. Like I think like District Nine does a, an incredible job of introducing the concept of what it is to be a refugee and how refugees are treated to an audience that may or may not actually have any previous knowledge of that. Um, well, and and the clever thing about that is, you know, and again, it's it shows both the the expectation or like the goals of the creator, but also what they know about their audience. And the whole reason that that movie is so clever is because he's South African, right? So he can barely tell a story that is about, uh, you know, refugees or the other in society or apartheid or whatever without people bringing their own baggage to bear on that. And so instead, he makes the aliens the other, and that just eliminates all of the previous history in terms of how people are, are responding, to that, or, or at least attempts to. So in, in modern South Africa, which is supposed to be uh, you know, a, a, an integrated society that's no longer uh, dealing with apartheid, you know, both uh, a white person and a black person can look at the alien in this movie as as the other. And so I, I think that kind of like intentionality um, is really effective. And then, and then, you know, like it can also just be flavoring, you know, like uh, Game of Thrones, you know, takes all kinds of liberties with like medieval history, but also in many cases, the, the, some of the like cultural and social things in it that hit the hardest are things that were taken directly from historical incidents. And so even if you're going to kind of go off the rails a little bit, like just as uh, world building and story potential, like, um, uh, you know, reading, uh, reading history and drawing upon it is really valuable. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's great. It's a really, a lot of really in depth, really good answers. I can tell that, like, it might sound funny, but like, you definitely have a really solid grasp on 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 this entire entire concept. Like, um, I, I'm curious if anybody has any questions about just like uh, like workflow or being an indie dev or anything. Yeah, like that. I was gonna say too. Like, maybe we could transition into like the the second half that you wanted to kind of go into and talk about um, as well, if you'd like to. Yeah, yeah. Hey, let me pull up. I have another set of slides. Um, For sure. Me, let me pull those up. Once those are up, I'm going to step away for just a few minutes. Um, if, if other people do have to sort of go, like, just for a moment, we might want to take sort of like a five-minute brief intermission. Yeah, let's just, let's just do that now. Okay. Sounds great. I'll be back in uh, just a few. Hey, All right. Like, okay. Yep. All right, I'm gonna send a quick, how long has it been like? Whoa, a picture just fell off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody closed the door and it just fell. That's that's not good. All right, well. Um, yeah, what has it been like? A few minutes, I'll put it like a thing that we're gonna start again in about two. Okay. Um, uh, so, you know, like another word that gets screwed up is like enjoyable, you know, because it seems like inappropriate to say like, oh, I found this game that was dealing with like a really ugly topic, enjoyable. But like no one would, you wouldn't feel bad if you said like, my favorite class in college was my history of the Holocaust class because I thought it was so good and important and I looked forward to going to it even though it was very intense and it made me sad because I thought it was like significant. Uh, you know, I think you can I think you can want your game to be people to respond to that the same way. Like it's not it's not really fun, it's not really entertaining, but it's meaningful and people can can appreciate that and and um, you know, take satisfaction from that, even though it is such a like intense, uh, you know, uh, ugly thing that they're that you're dealing with. No, definitely. I think um, Professor Sloda also has. I remember in one or two classes, if I'm remembering correctly, I think it was game systems. We talked about how basically games are constructed upon rule sets and those rule sets pretty much 
you know, are a combination of making things convenient or inconvenient to the player to an extent to which that creates a challenge, right? So, you know, once you once you kind of get to that emotional side of things, does is the emotional aspect of a game suddenly becoming part of that rule set structure, right? Mm. Like, yeah. Yeah. if you're playing The Walking Dead and you have to kill off a character that you really love in order to progress, is that building your own rule set and player agency, right? Right, yeah, yeah. Um, or just like, you know, sometimes when you're playing a story game, it'll be like, choices matter, you know? Like, <laughs> follow your heart. But like, people are smart enough that like, as they're playing the game, they'll be like, okay, like I'm gonna make this choice not because it's what I want or because what I'm I'm embodying, but but because it's what I feel like the game wants me to do, and I want to get the quote unquote good ending, you know, or something like that. Um, oh so yeah, no, are... totally, totally. Like there's there's a there's a quick spoiler alert, but it's from um it's from Fire Emblem Three Houses, right? Like there's there's literally just a choice you make in that game that is either wipe out the demons or perform mass genocide on society and you don't know that 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 the results are either of those because you just don't know and yeah it's just the funniest thing because it's like no i do not want to do genocide i want to destroy the demons like <laughs> which is a, which yeah which is another disconnect i think with a lot of narrative games which we have yet to solve in like the choices matter department where it's like you know um do you want to do a or b and it's like well I want to do A, but only in the way that I would do it. And then you pick A, and the character does technically that, but in a way that undercuts your motivation or whatever. And so then you feel that disconnect again. It's um, like the it's the problem with Fallout Four or Fallout Four. Fallout Four, nice, but it's like how in Fallout Four you have such limited dialogue options that sometimes they just like you. Sometimes your character will be like, oh, you know, like. One of the options will be say hello, and your character just walks in. He like bursts in the room, like, "What's going on, losers? I'm here to take all your money." <laughs> like, right. yeah, exactly. Yeah, I. Uh, in terms of fun, I don't. This is like a paper that I've thought of that I think would be really good, but I don't want to write it because now I just want to make games. But if anybody, <laughs> wants, if anybody wants to write this, paper, this is a really good thesis, uh, which is that the. Um, uh, in art, you know, for the longest time, the uh, the goal was beauty, and then you finally get in like the late nineteenth and early twentieth century, people who are making art that is not beautiful, and it is really it really offends people and makes them mad, and like the whole modern art movement, and then you have a big argument about what even is art, and then people arguing about can art be not beautiful, blah 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 blah, blah. and I feel like a, a very similar thing has happened in games, but instead of the central. Um, ethic being beauty it's fun and so games are supposed to be fun games are supposed to have rules games are supposed to have winners and then we get to a point where people start like rebelling against that and it makes everyone mad <laughs> and then you get into discussion of like is this really a game if it's not fun just like people were saying like is this really art if it's an ugly painting or if it's a blank canvas with a with a that's presented or something like that um but uh the, the the last part of that that I think is really ironic is that uh, in some cases the games that are are criticized for not being a game because they're not fun enough uh, the thing that they're offering is beauty <laughs> which is the thing that the artists were mad uh, wasn't being represented um, so I don't know if anybody ever wants to do a comparative thing about that I bet you can get it published but uh, I don't want I don't want to write it anymore art <laughs> thank you professor. Art, art trademarked. I love that. Just art TM. That's all right. So yeah, I think that uh, most people have come back. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and make the. Um, I'm gonna mute my mic. I'm gonna turn the floor over to you again. Um, for those all of right. you who may not who may not know, Professor Coltrane gave a talk at GDC um, a few years back, and he's going to give us a snippet of that. So I'm gonna go ahead and mute and just kind of get it set up. Yeah, so this is just kind of like things you could know and a little bit of outline about how you might approach like uh, doing a period game. This is like more intensive than maybe what some of you might do as students. This is kind of more directed to like a mid-level studio and up, but uh, you might take some of these same principles. So uh, first slide is obviously like historical settings are really big, even in the AAA game industry. But there's a few things that we want to know about history. And the first is that uh, there's no there, there's no set version of history. You know, a lot of times uh, people think of like history as just being this like 
this narrative that like everybody knows. And so I just have to go and find out what it is and then represent that in my game. But history is not like the Bible. It's not a set thing. Um, even in a textbook, uh, there are all kinds of uh, compromises and interpretations that are being made to give us even the most basic version of history. And what historians do is, you know, they, there's not a story that they get to start with. They have to go somewhere to essentially what is usually a pile of garbage uh, and then try to interpret this in some way and pull a narrative out of that. And uh, they're going to bring their, their personal experiences and their biases to that. And everybody who interprets this, this pile of garbage is going to do it in a different way. And so um, when you are making a historical game, you are basically engaging in that as well. You are becoming a historian and you are putting together a, a thing. So first of all, like history is not the truth. It's not math. Um, you can be persuasive and unpersuasive. And there are certain things, you know, that we can have as facts. We can say like, you know, George Washington was a real person. Uh, but as soon as we, you know, even if we could go back to be inside of George Washington's head and not only be present at the time, but literally know what he was thinking, we still couldn't say that's the truth because uh, everybody who was at the time is experiencing these things in, in different ways. So uh, we want to get as close to the experience as ordinary people uh, in this period, if we can, uh, to sort of get at what actually happened. But just, you know, you're never going to be able to perfectly like embody this. OK, the, the second thing is that every time somebody does this, we get a different interpretation. So all of these guys have their own interpretation. And these are people who are actually there. And of course, this painting is also total bullshit. Uh, but um, uh, that means that, um, you know, we have multiple versions of history that are out there. Um, so multiple piles of garbage. Uh, and then also history changes over time because. Uh, it, as we go through history and people in different periods look back at the same events in the past, uh, we're going to get different interpretations. And, you know, we can see how this changes in the public where, you know, somebody like Andrew Jackson, who uh, had a really strong reputation maybe in the 1940s, uh, now has a very negative one, I think justly deserved, um, and uh, potentially could be uh, replaced by people uh, whose uh, overall reputation has risen in the same period, like Harriet Tubman. Um, let's see. Okay. Here I'm talking a little bit about making Cassius. Okay. And then, uh, let's see, let me skip ahead a little bit. Okay. Um, so now let's talk about like how we could actually gather, um, history. Okay. Um, uh, let's say that you wanted to, you know, do a, an Aztec theme game. Okay. Like where should you start? Like a, a pretty good way to start is just try to find, a nice general book uh, that is uh, written by a professional. And of course the question is like, how can we tell uh, somebody who is a professional from, from somebody who isn't or somebody who did an adequate job? Uh, and uh, one of the things that we wanna look to is the idea of peer review. Um, and so almost all uh, books written by history professors and other you know, like museum professionals and things like that are peer reviewed, uh, which just means that um, you know before it's published, it goes out to other anonymous experts who have worked in the same area of history and they read through all the footnotes and think about all the sources and write back and say whether or not they think this person is making a good faith effort at representing the past. And then an editor based on those reports decides whether or not to publish it. Now that's not a uh, fail safe that this is gonna be good history. It's not even a fail safe against, to protect against fraud, uh, but it does give us like uh, a little bit of insurance that you know, what is being presented to us is not totally um, crackpot, okay? And when you're looking for historical resources, you wanna think about uh, primary sources, which could include things like diaries and letters, records, interviews, maps and photographs, arts and ar art and artifacts and architecture. Okay, these are all things that come, you know, from directly from the period in question. And, you know, one exciting thing is that increasingly, you know, every single year, more of these things are available online. Um, so all of you, even if you're working on a small indie thing, if you, you know, want to read documents in the period, it's never been easier to actually get those. You know, a lot of times in the past, you'd have to get on a plane and go, uh, to an archive somewhere. Uh, but now a lot of those things are available. And then we also have secondary sources. So these are books, journal articles, encyclopedias, documentaries, museum exhibits, uh, where a historical professional has summarized or made an interpretation about history using uh, those sorts of primary sources. And uh, both of these are gonna be um, uh, beneficial to you uh, as, you're, as you're looking in. And of course, I uh, use some of these in Cassius. So I showed the slave past 
um, uh, in the game. This is a, the uh, one of the actual archival references uh, ref, uh, references that's in Williamsburg that I looked at. Uh, and the map is also based on a on a period map. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, uh, so we also have, and of course, since all of you are in school now, you have uh, um, access to lots of uh, ways to find secondary history, like journal articles. Um, and then there are some things that are kind of both, you know, like a newspaper from a historical period is both a secondary source because they are referring back to, you know, uh, other people's accounts, uh, but it becomes a primary source for us because uh, it is a newspaper direct from the, the period. Okay. Um, so where could you get started on, uh, you know, looking for, uh, things that are respectable? Um, you know, if you want, you know, just to find a good general book on something to get you started, uh, uh, you know, you can just go on like, uh, Amazon and, uh, you know, even just like if you're, you know, say you're interested in the Aztecs, just type in Aztecs, see what comes up, but then look at the credentials of the people who wrote the, wrote the book. Okay. Are they connected with a, uh, university or historic institution, and then just look at, you know, does it look at the press of the book? And then you can Google that and see if it's a scholarly press that, that goes through the peer review process. Um, and, and once you are getting into the segment of, uh, of peer reviewed books, uh, sometimes also just the, the like, uh, you know, customers who bought this also bought other things can be helpful because uh, once you get to a certain level of nerdy books and get away from like the, you know, ancient aliens type stuff, uh, you know, a lot of these authors are going to be in common. Another really good resource is Google Scholar. Um, so you can type in the, the what you know, whatever sort of terms you're interested in and uh, see scholarly uh, books and articles that are written about these. But you can also tell what's influential because it lists the number of citations. And so this can give you an idea of what is kind of central. Um, the things that are most cited are not always going to be the most readable to average people. So you can kind of go back and forth and use your judgment about how to find a home base. Um, but that can get you started. And then once you have kind of a, a central text or, or documentary or something like that, that's giving you your base information or, a you know, a textbook, anything like that, then you can just start going uh, into the citations, looking at their footnotes, looking at the bibliography, looking at other things that look interesting to you and just slowly kind of build your web out from there. Um, and that could take you to, you know, primary sources in the archives. Uh, you can uh, also, you know, uh, even in something that's older, if you see the name of an archival institution, you know, if the guy says like, or the woman says, uh, all the you know documents I use to make this are from the South Carolina Historical Society. Uh, well, nowadays it's, it's useful to actually go to their website and see if they have some of those things available online. Colonial Williamsburg has a lot of their documents digitized. Uh, so if I found a footnote to one of those, I could go read those directly online. And here's the entry for the, the past that I used in my game. Um, another really good site is archive.org, uh, which is an aggregator for a bunch of different um, cultural resources. And especially for things that are in public domain, uh, they have links to a number of large libraries that have done a lot of scanning. And you can find most older published books, not only just the, the text, but the actual images of the page on archive.org. Um, and so um, I found a number of complete copies of like 18th century books that like Thomas Jefferson owned and stuff like that, that I used uh, as references. Another good aggregator is the Digital Public Library of America, uh, which just indexes a lot of other cultural institutions things and also has a lot of multimedia. So those are really good things uh, once you have a trail to kind of follow. Um, and here's another uh, one of these like period 18th century books that I found. Um, also, you know, especially as a game developer, um, if you're interested in period research, I want to encourage you very early in the process to look at uh, what we call material culture, you know, art, architecture, um, uh, fashion, tools, uh, technology, um, because uh, a lot of times the collections of uh, art museums and history museums are going to have uh, much better visual records uh, than uh, actual uh, published history, which is going to tend to focus more on like causal events and, and themes and stuff like that. Uh, again, the colonial winter uh, collections here were really invaluable to me. Um, and increasingly, a lot of art museums have their entire collections available online. Uh, so I know right now uh, uh, the Met uh, in New York, the Art Institute of Chicago, I believe the Getty Museum in L.A., 
uh, the British Museum in uh, uh, London, uh, all have every uh, thing in their entire collection uh, digitized and available online. And so those can be really, really useful. Um, and uh, uh, at this point, you might consider like also contacting some experts, okay? And so um, let's first let's break down the types of experts that you might contact and kind of the benefits of each, okay? So on one hand, we have scholarly historians. And uh, these are people who are focused on discovering totally new things about history and making totally new interpretations. Um, and so these are people like professors uh, and then archivists and librarians who maintain the sources that are used for totally new discoveries. And these people can be very useful to you. Um, they're gonna have, um, they're going to be very good about telling you about big themes, about like what matters, what happened and why. Uh, they're also going to be very useful to tell you like what are the disagreements in this field? Because again, you know, history is a discussion. So people are going to have different opinions on things. Uh, and they're also very likely to be up to like the very newest things that are being published and argued. And so those can be very useful for like the broader like social and narrative um, uh, elements of your game. On the other hand, we have public historians, and these are people who uh, are uh, presenting history uh, to the public, uh, usually in the form of some kind of recreation or entertainment. So these are people like museum staff, archivists, educators, park rangers. Um, and these are people maybe who in some cases may or may not be up on some of these big themes and big debates, uh, but they're gonna know about all the everyday life things that are gonna be really important to actually making your game environment meaningful. Um, and they also sometimes are going to be interested in like, you know, like a perfect example of this is say, say you're doing a war game. OK, like the scholarly historian is going to be able to tell you like all of the social currents maybe that led to the war happening. Uh, but they're not going to have the time to know like, oh, these are what all the regiment commanders were. Or this is the type of patch that this unit wore. Or this is the type of backpack that this that this group had. Uh, but the public historians may actually know those things. So it's useful when you start reaching out to experts to. Uh, to, to uh, investigate both sides of this divide. And even increasingly, you know, you have to kind of uh, do your homework to make sure you're not getting a total quack. Uh, but there are also people on YouTube uh, who do public history. And so this is a YouTube channel uh, that uh, I've consulted a little bit for Cassius. It's a, it's a guy who runs a company who makes um, uh, uh, reproduction 18th century equipment for uh, historical reenactments. And uh, he also has a 18th century uh, cooking channel uh, and he wears a silly hat in every single episode. Um, so uh, tips for reaching out to a historian to consult with. And it is unfortunately true that many historians can be a little prickly. Uh, and so how do you do this in a way where it's gonna, uh, you're gonna make the best impression and it's gonna, you're gonna have the most effective um, time, okay? Uh, the first thing is, you need to do a little bit of homework, okay? You will automatically piss somebody off if they are like, you know, a professor at Yale who's a world expert and you write them and you say like, what was the American Revolution, okay? Um, you need to have consulted a lot of sources, read a lot, looked around a lot, um, so that uh, if you have, especially a prominent person's valuable time, that you're asking them really specific stuff that you couldn't have just gotten, especially like from really easy sources, like just reading a Wikipedia article or something like that. Okay. Uh, the second thing is uh, I would ease them into the idea that you're making a video game. And this goes back to my, you know, the previous discussion about sensitivity. But um, a lot of people that I talked to about Cassius, the first time I made contact with them, I didn't even tell them I was doing a game. I said that I was doing like a media project or a 3D reconstruction or something like that. Um, and then slowly brought them into that in case they were, they were um, scared of the idea of a game. Uh, the third thing is be open to young scholars. Uh, the way that the professor at works is, you know, um, uh, uh, you um, have to work really, really hard, uh, get your book out, then get tenure. Um, and then uh, sometimes, you know, those people who are very, very famous, the types of people whose book you might actually be able to buy in a bookstore or might appear in a documentary or something, tend to be a lot more senior. Um, and not only may they may be so busy that they're less likely to talk to you, they may also be a little bit out of the loop. And young people who are really fight, kind of fighting to make their place uh, might be more open to contributing. They certainly might be more likely to have exposure to video games, but they may actually have more of an ear to the ground about what's happening 
uh, than somebody who's been like a big success for like 30 or 40 years. And it's just kind of writing that. Um, uh, additionally, the fourth thing is, uh, you know, um, make sure that you kind of don't corner anybody, you know, so when you talk to them, uh, let them know, you know, that, uh, uh, you, you know, you're not asking for anything in, in particular that you'd, you'd be very open if they wanted to chat with you. Um, and then, you know, if you do end up using somebody as a consultant, uh, make sure that you are checking back in with them regularly, that you let them see the finished progress, the finished product. And you always get the option to remove their name from it if they no longer feel like it's something that, uh, you know, reflects what they care about. And then the uh, last thing, and this is for students. Uh, or this is less for students uh, than for professionals. But uh, if you can pay somebody for their time or for their contribution, uh, that will make a huge difference, obviously, in how much uh, attention and respect you get. But also um, just like, uh, you know, how that uh, relationship goes. And then finally, like um, compared to other sites of talent that you might employ, uh, making a game is like a mid-level indie or something like that. Historians are pretty cheap dates. OK, like. Uh, you know, you give somebody $250 for, um, you know, half an hour of voice acting. Uh, but if you gave that to a historian for consulting with you over a couple of phone calls, it would just blow their mind. Uh, so and, unless they're like at Harvard or something. Um, OK, so I can't even remember what the joke on that slide was. Let's see. Uh, uh, bu, 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 bu. Okay. Oh yeah. So we're talking a little bit about like um, interpreting sources and like dealing with bias. And so I just want to talk about like a couple of kinds of uh, bias uh, to watch out for. Now, first of all, there's like personal bias, um, you know, that goes with the, the, you know, the background and the biography of the person. But there's also a couple of um, uh, other kinds of bias that we we want to be out that uh, on the lookout for that are very common, but are we're kind of less familiar with. Uh, one is survival bias. And uh, this is just the idea that um, uh, the more likely a source is to survive, um, the bigger disproportionate impact it's going to have on what we think happened in the past. And so a great example of this is like the, uh, the idea of cavemen. OK, uh, uh, we call, the, you know, like Neolithic people and sometimes shorthand cavemen. And the reason we do is because. The only artworks of theirs that survive are inside of caves. But that doesn't mean that they live primarily in caves. In fact, they probably hardly ever went in caves. But we don't have any of their other art that doesn't survive. The stuff in the caves survived. And so that's why we disproportionately associate a life that looks something like this with caves. So we want to watch out for that. <coughs> the other thing is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, document bias. OK, so a document uh, uh, has a set format and a set purpose, and it's only going to tell us what is uh, available in the purpose of the document. So like something uh, very, very overt on this level would be like an ad for an escaped slave. This is gonna tell us a ton of information uh, about the appearance, about the daily life of enslaved people, but it's gonna do that from the perspective of somebody who uh, not only owns them, but wants to get them back. And so uh, we have to take that into account. On a much lesser level, you know, like say the only records you had of a small town were from the church. Well, you shouldn't just be thinking like, oh man, uh, religion dominates every aspect of this town's life. Because of course, uh, maybe if you had the um, town hall documents, there would hardly be anything about religion in there. And it would similarly be a mistake to say, oh, this was a totally sec sec secular society. You need to read the documents you have imagining all of the ones that you don't have and think about why don't you have those and what might that gap be. Um, here to talk a little bit about accuracy and how this is totally impossible. Uh, there's a great Onion video that I showed to my other class uh, about making the, the most uh, realistic uh, war game of all time. And the joke is that in the most realistic war game of all time, uh, you would just spend like seven or eight hours just like waiting around or like fixing your truck or something like that. And so that's to show that there are um, uh, getting things historically accurate uh, can be difficult. Uh, I don't remember what these slides are for. Let's see. Let's skip ahead. Okay. Um, but um, a few things that we uh, might think about um, in terms of accuracy is like one, like, do you want to engage with uh, the mythology around your topic? 
uh, do you want to indulge that mythology or do you just want to uh, correct that? So like, for instance, uh, common misconceptions about history. Napoleon was not really shorter than average. Uh, Vikings didn't have horns on their helmets. Uh, Paul Revere would not have said the British are coming because uh, he's British. Okay. Uh, so you think about, you know, do I want to include the mythology in the, in the game or not? There's, no, there's not a right or wrong answer for that necessarily, but you can think about that. Um, additionally, like, how do you want to deal with uh, controversial figures? Um, somebody like Christopher Columbus uh, is interpreted in very different ways by different groups, although I'm more towards the right side than the left side. Uh, how do you want to handle that? Uh, um, and then also, you know, like, how do you want to handle things that um, uh, are true historically, but might uh, kind of um, be interpreted in a different way by your audience? So like, for instance, in the 18th century, uh, this is an extremely manly uh, picture. You know, this is like the equivalent of like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, like flexing his arms. Uh, but, you know, he, with his dainty little collars and his kind of emphasis on his round hips and stuff like this, this is a different image of masculinity uh, than we have in the present day. So do you want to use the accurate 18th century one and say this is a, a guy who's like a real man's man? Uh, at the time, or do you want to graft a modern image of masculinity onto that because the audience will interpret that more easily? Um, uh, and there's also just like uh, thinking about the practical concerns and like costs of things is a really good thing to keep in mind. Like in Uncharted, you find this secret pirate town with all these super elaborate uh, pirate statues. And the question is like, okay, this is a secret pirate hideout. Who is paying like, uh, these hundreds of like Renaissance quality artists to come and sculpt all of these pirate statues. Um, sometimes just thinking about the money involved can really help you uh, define an environment uh, a little bit more about cases. And then like another thing, and I know we've talked a lot about Assassin's Creed in my other class, um, but I think another good test uh, that's interesting for a historical game is to think about like um, uh, what in your um, game is specific only to the historical period that you're talking about. And, and something that bugs me about a lot of Assassin's Creed games is that I feel like a lot of the quests that you have uh, maybe in Assassin's Creed Egypt could also be in Assassin's Creed Greece or Assassin, uh, Assassin's Creed London or whatever like that. And I, and I think that our historical games are more interesting when we get in enough into the culture of the time that we have people acting on motivations that uh, would be particular to their time and thinking about things that would be particular to their to their time. Um, so like, uh, and and I talked about a little of this before in my comments, but I'm very interested, I think this is a challenge for people doing historical games in the future, is to try to get inside like the mental spaces of people in the past and convey those. Because I think this is one of the things that's the hardest to get down. Like it's easy to have like a, um, uh, a uh, uh, an environment that looks really accurate or fashion that looks really accurate or something like that. But I, I think uh, it's a, it's a um, challenge in the future for us to try to get inside the minds of people and how things would have felt. So like a good example of this is like, you know, a medieval cathedral to us might feel very like mysterious and like um, uh, intense and kind of mystical. Okay. Uh, but uh, to somebody at the time, you know, this same like side chapel that was endowed by like a rich patron might have felt really tacky and commercial, uh, almost like a corporate sponsorship of a stadium or something like that. Um, uh, similarly, uh, I'm trying to remember what the joke was with the, uh, <laughs> the slide, but I can't even remember. Um, but uh, similarly, you know, um, like uh, with Egyptian hieroglyphs, this is something that I think is really fascinating. Uh, they had all these different, you know, they had the, uh, uh, very simple uh, carved ones. They had the written script, which is a little bit different. And then sometimes they had very, very uh, artistic representations of um, the individual hieroglyphs. Uh, but because they didn't have a formal distinction between um, uh, art and letters, uh, that means sometimes that uh, uh, their words and art could be sort of interchangeable. And I just think this is such an interesting thing to like try to try to represent in a game. So for instance, like uh, this uh, uh, like brooch here, which just has a scarab and a, a sun disc is actually um, a, a hieroglyph. So it's both art and words at the same time. 
And uh, so we could see like it's made up of this royal name with the sun and the scarab, okay, and the um, uh, mouth. And those are all put together in a way. And so what that means is like, not only can the art be uh, words, but in something like this, where this is more pictorial, um, that in an ancient Egyptian mind, like uh, the duck, the um, uh, papyrus fronds, uh, some of these different things that just look like art to us are also letters so that they're like making a noise in your head when you look at this. And so that's just an example of like the type of thing where you could get in you know, somebody's head and maybe have like a really different experience. Uh, and then the last thing is like, you know, like I make very relatively accurate games, but like you're not bound to, you know, but I do think the research helps you regardless. So like if you're interested in pirates and here's this uh, very silly cover to old Sid Meier's Meier pirates, uh, you might look at a bunch of different pirate uh, research, you might have your primary documents and your, your secondary scholarly history. Okay. And then you might kind of divide up uh, all the things that you are finding into different categories. So here's things we associate with pirates, loot, black flags, eye patches, et cetera, black beard. These are all real. Okay. And then we have some things that are probably not quite real, like the pirate voice or peg legs or buried treasure. Um, and then we have things that we might not have thought of at all, like uh, the presence of women pirates, uh, the ethnic diversity, the fact that pirate ships were kind of run as democracies with health insurance. Okay. And so then, you know, all the things that I talked about earlier, like your intent, uh, the message you want to send, the audience, the genre you're interested in, the tone that you're interested in, you know, you can draw upon all these things and consciously make decisions about whether or not you want to do something like Sea of Thieves that's more fanciful or something like Black Flag that's a little bit more realistic. Neither of these is particularly um, uh, accurate, uh, but they're both like playing with the available information. So uh, I think. I think at the end of the day, like doing your research helps you make a better game, even if it's a little beep boop shooter or something like that. Um, but uh, just having that sort of awareness about uh, where you're at, uh, trying to get um, uh, a representative picture uh, of what's going on and then and then make conscious decisions about where you're going to be faithful to that and where you're not uh, can help you make your, your period game better. So that's just a little, that's a real quick and dirty toolkit. And uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask in the last 10 minutes about that, I'm happy to hear them. Thank you. That's very good. My microphone was off on the recording, so all <laughs> I guess on YouTube, everybody watching is just going to hear a bunch of clapping out of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> that's totally fine, but yeah, if there are any other questions, uh, feel free to ask them now. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question, kind of just a silly general question. Um, what, like, historical period or theme or, or person or event or place or any anything historical and specific um, that you think is like hasn't really been represented in media or especially in games that like you would love to see a game made about yeah uh i mean i have one totally in mind which is i keep uh uh I mean, I use that example in my slides, but I, I keep referring to like my future game where in a fantasy I have like, you know, like a CD project red level studio to blow my reputation on. Um, and I call it Grand Theft Aztec uh, because I would just love to see 
like a giant like open world like red dead style game that was in um uh at the height of the aztec empire with like tenochtitlan and uh this giant city on a lake that has like floating terraces where people are growing flowers and like uh pyramids and like this very interesting social network and then at some point you know the the spanish invade and there's a giant uh uh war in the space and i just i I think that's super super interesting i think uh Central and South America are really, really un- un- underrepresented uh, in like nerd genre media. Um, and so I'd love to see something on that scale. I'm kind of shocked that there hasn't been an Assassin's Creed yet. Honestly, that's in Mesoamerica, but that would be that would be what I would spend my four hundred million dollars on if I had a, if I had a choice. All right. Awesome. I have another question that's kind of related to that which is basically, um, how do you feel as a historian about the skinning of games with historical content and then being marketed as if it's historical? Because that's one of my biggest pet peeves with things like uh, Assassin's Creed, right? Like that, and and to a lesser extent, things like Papers, Please, which I think is intentionally designed to express a particular way of being at a particular time and place thematically without cribbing too much from actual history. But like, with Assassin's Creed, ancient Greece or ancient Egypt or whatever, like you were saying, a lot of those things feel like they exist for the sake of somebody who had an idea for a mechanic or a way that the world should work and they just need the thing to put on top of it. So like, do you have any particular thoughts about the way that other, that industry professionals have kind of treated history and um, the way that it probably should be treated instead? Yeah, I, well, I think it's, it's I, I like how you brought Papers, Please up, because I think that is a really good example of something like what I was talking about with like the Crucible, right? Where it's like he he has invented this like kind of fictional, vaguely like Soviet satellite republic for the story to happen in. And then we have this like we have this experience that's about like, you know, sort of the banality of evil and like the your complicity within like a bureaucratic totalitarian structure and all that. So I, I think that's a I, I really like. Uh, that I also like his second game, uh, Oberdin. Lucas Pope is the developer. In terms of like how I feel about like big historical stuff and like Assassin's Creed, um, yeah, I mean, honestly, like, I mean, part of me is more comfortable with things that are not purporting to be sort of accurate or um, serious, given you know the fact that something like Assassin's Creed clearly is not super accurate or serious. I think maybe they're getting a little better as they, as they go along. But um, I don't know, I, like I'm, I'm split on this in a couple of ways. Like one is on the one hand, as a historian, it does not bother me that there is a lot of flaky stuff out there. And part of the reason for this is like, I can remember being in a um, uh, uh, archeology span class in graduate school with like one of the top uh, Mesoamerican archaeologist in in the world, uh, who's like the best scholar of like uh, Mesoamerican like women in the Aztec and like Toltec periods, and uh, we went around the room and everybody told like why you know I was a historian but most of them were archaeology students and all of them said like why did they get into archaeology and like at least half of the people said because of Indiana Jones <laughs> and obviously like Indiana Jones is a horrible portrayal of archaeology and uh you know uh, i love those movies but you know very problematic and very silly and uh racist in parts and um uh you know but that that gave them like the seed of interest to explore that further and so i i'm more liberal on that i think sometimes that that does more more good than harm um i i do think that in terms of like how the people who are supposedly trying you know, what I'd like to see differently. I think the biggest thing is that they tend to be really, really good on the things that are objective. So like uh, fashion, architecture, technology, you know, those are things that they are, they are interested in, uh, but they are rarely interested in showing like any difference in culture, religion, gender, uh, politics, social structure, class, you know, like, any of these uh, uh, things that are kind of like uh, not actually on the screen in the form of graphics. And those to me are some of the most interesting things about history is those those wild differences in the way that like human societies work compared to the present. And I also think that those would be some of the most fertile 
like grounds for like making your game exciting. And so I really wish that like you, I think you even use the term like reskinning. Yeah. That like, you know, if you have a fetch quest in ancient Egypt, that for a, a variety of reasons that feels totally different than a fetch quest in ancient Greece, because they have totally different ethics and worldviews and cosmologies and everything. Uh, but I don't get that sense when I, when I play those. Um, so that's, that's, that, that's what I would like to see done better. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I I feel similarly where it's it's not so much the skinning of a thing that bothers me as long as they're being honest about what they're trying to do, um, as opposed to sort of creating it. I've been thinking a lot about this with respect to like Shadow of Mordor and Shadow of War, where they are not particularly uh, fidelitous to Tolkien's worldview or his views on culture or anything else. But mechanics of the game are themselves interesting and it's so frustrating because they took a thing that could have been used in a completely different and more meaningful way and then just put something on top of it because they needed to sell the, the mechanics and so like I, I struggle with that a lot with history just because history it was so boring to me through high school and then I got to college and suddenly it was interesting because people told me the truth like and so there's a lot of opportunities there I think you mentioned um, specifically like the technical facts, the things that are easy to portray visually are always usually pretty accurate. It's the, the heart of the culture and needing to explain the subtleties and differences in things like gender or sexuality or race relations or all these other things that are narratively interesting, but um, maybe not necessarily the, the thing that they as designers are well versed in. And actually this is this kind of the follow up I wanted to ask you is, do you think one of the reasons for this is related to the fact that game design pipeline from high school to college to industry is oriented toward sort of all of those technical things and oriented away from the humanities? Because that is one thing that I think UConn does differently and better than other schools that are really reputable for uh, game design is that it's a more holistic approach to understanding design as opposed to here's how to do the computer science part of it. And we're not going to talk to you about the narrative because that's, that's you know, wussy stuff. Like no one cares about it. It's like the uh, the D and D Game of Thrones statement about how like themes are for eighth grade book reports. So like, I, I feels like there needs to be a better balance of humanities to, to the computer science side. Maybe maybe you can kind of speak to that as somebody in the humanities. Yeah, I think it can be like a leadership problem. I mean, some of it's a skill set problem. You know, I mean, we can all go on Steam and we can see like the game that was made, the indie game that was made by the person who's primarily an artist who doesn't really know how to code and doesn't know how to tell a story. And that looks a certain way. And then we can see the game that's primarily made by a programmer and that's primarily made by a writer. And then, you know, sometimes when they get into bigger teams, uh, maybe you get a little more of a balanced skill set, but it tends to, you know, whoever has the, the final decision-making power tends to influence that. I think the limitations of their skill set sometimes are going to affect like the type of story that can get told. But to me, when I look at the bigger games, I think the biggest problem is, um, the the workflow of these large companies and definitely in Assassin's Creed, but it's the fact that, and and this is like, this is like a pet peeve of my own too, but like, I, I feel like that um, even though obviously game dev, game dev on a large scale is so collaborative and so iterative and is going to require like a ton of cooks that um, uh, when these games don't have like the sort of like grand directorial vision that like a film does, even though a film, you know, also empl could employ like 10,000 people or something on it. Um, it's just impossible for them to achieve a lot of these, like a lot of this thematic nuance. And the way that the, um, you know, a game like Assassin's Creed is made is like, they pick the historical period, uh, then they start working on the title and the marketing, they start building the map, they start building the combat, and then at some point halfway through that, they start handing the production Bible to the artist and the narrative designers and just saying like, OK, like make your stuff fit into this. And of course, that all if that was going to tell like a story about like what ancient Greece was really like or what ancient Egypt was really like, that all of those things would need to come from like the same um, origin point. Uh, right. Because like what the map looks like would be related to the story and like what the combat looks like would be related to the story. And all those things would be related to the historical culture. Um, and then the additionally, you know, you have the level of in some of these companies like no one has that authority because you have the team leads and they're all responsible instead of like to a director to like a board of like a corporate board 
that has their own, you know, demands about like, you know, oh, we need more cleavage on this oh, female character. We, you know, we signed this like uh, metal band to do the uh, uh, soundtrack or just like, you know, whatever weird things, you know, their monster energy partnership or something. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I do think that this opens a moment, I think, you know, both in the way we train people at UConn, but also like for small indie teams to be like, you know, you you can make something that is a more culturally rich experience than almost any AAA studio uh, could do because you will have that clarity of vision. And if any of you are ever interested in, in um, uh, doing a period game, I would think about this from the very, very beginning. You know, when you think about like, what period am I interested? What story am I interested in the, in this in this period? You know, you you should make that connection between culture and genre and mechanic very early. You know, nothing should be waiting till the end and just be, you know, like, you know, saying just like, you know, like every game used to be like a reskin side scroller or something like that. You know, you should be thinking like, oh, OK, I want to do a hidden object game or I want to do a card game or I want to do a um, a bullet hell shooter. What? uh what periods in history what stories in history actually match like the emotions that are involved in those genres and those mechanics and, and start from the very beginning with that oh uh, yeah okay i think with that uh that'll end today's meeting uh you are all more than welcome to stay and chat more if you like I'm gonna run. I've got a couple things to do today, um, and I would I would stay in chat if I could. Um, but thank you very much again, Professor, for taking the time to come and give this talk and show your game. Um, a reminder to everyone that you can play uh, the beta build of Professor Coltrane's game. Um, the download link is in the announcements channel. I'll be putting it in the meeting notes as well once this is uploaded. Uh, but I'm sure he would love. To hear any feedback you guys might have um and yeah yeah absolutely and the other thing i would say is uh, if uh, i don't know if anybody had, had played that already today but if you haven't played it and you're interested in it uh i would go, i would say go ahead and wait like another three or four days and then i'll be able to put up the version that has the uh the voice acting in it and uh i'll uh, uh i'm not super active on discord i would try to be better about that but uh anybody just hit me up at any time with a, a bug or a question or critique or anything, do not be shy. Uh, I, I do not have a thin skin, um, uh, and especially bugs, uh, anything I'd love to hear about. And, and, and thanks for coming out and listening. Thank you for, thank you for coming out and, and talking. It was great. I had a fantastic time, and I know that a lot of people here did too. Um, yeah, if you're all of, you, uh, all of those people watching on YouTube, because um, I know we have a few members who will watch these uh, online, uh, thank you for watching. I'll put a link um, to this video in the Discord as well. Um, as always, there's a link uh, that should be in the rules and FAQ if you'd like to invite your friends to the server. Um, and yeah, just tell Utah UConn students about it, alumni about it, if you've got friends that go to other schools too. Um, because we are online, um, they do not need permission from the university to attend these. We have a few people who are graduated or are not students at UConn specifically who are able to attend because of that. Um, so yeah, you know, just uh, if anybody's interested, feel free to invite them. And yeah, I think that about wraps it up. Thank you every, uh, for everybody for coming out. I hope you all have a great weekend. And uh, yeah, enjoy the NCAA playoffs. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again. All right, see you later, guys.